Hello, Shadowcat back, and it's time for another direct message. I'm just kind of winging this one because I am both lazy and incompetent and all kinds of other things that do not adequately excuse or explain why I haven't done more direct messages lately. Although, in honesty, it all comes down to the fact that while there's a lot of things to talk about, I'm constantly held back by my feeling that I'm just not really qualified to talk about most things. Regardless of that, though, I am going to talk about something today because, if nothing else, this is my chance to vent a little bit. And goodness knows I have things to vent about. So what am I talking about today? Well, I mean, you saw the title. And let's be honest, it's about the only thing that anyone is talking about anywhere ever right now. I mean, people have been talking about it since uh, Biden's last speech. That got literally everyone talking about it. And before then, there were more people that were talking about civil war before that. I mean, people have been talking about civil war going back to the election. People have been talking about that since before the election, going all the way back to 2016. And there's even been a few uh, few people have been saying that it's probably been coming even longer than that. You'll get different people who report, you know, different times when they think that, oh, this was the moment when we started heading down the path of the Civil War. Take it with a grain of salt, I guess. So, why do I want to talk about it today? Well, it's not going to be to say that it is or isn't happening. Because if I had to be honest, and I'm going to be honest with you, I think it is. I think it's actually already started. And you got to keep in mind that in the previous Civil War, the previous Civil War went on for years and years and years and years. Without any real... No, I guess there was technically a declaration of war at the beginning, but, I mean, we when we talk about the events, there was a lot that led up to that declaration of war that we consider part of the Civil War, but the people that were living during that time, they had no idea. And how could they have any idea? I mean, you can't really tell that you're in a forest when you're in the middle of it. All you can see is trees. Are you in a forest? Is it just a few trees? Is it a lot of trees? You don't know because you don't have the big picture from outside. Of course, we look back now and we can say, yeah, that was the Civil War. And that's why we have to look back now and say, these were the things that were happening back then. Are we repeating the same things? And unfortunately, in this case, we kind of are. We are repeating a lot of things that were done. Uh, the first Civil War, yeah, there were a lot of things that started it. I can't name one. But, I mean, a big one was states' rights. I mean, before you even had the Union and the Confederacy, you had the Union, basically, the, the northern states, trying to tell the southern states how they were to do their business, how they were to conduct their states, and a major part of it, not the only part, but a major part, was the fact that they said, look, it's our state. You can't tell us what to do. Of course, in some matters they could, in other matters they couldn't. I mean, by and large, we did have the Constitution. If the Constitution said you couldn't do something, then that was it. Of course, that was back when the Constitution was actually respected, but I'll get to that in a minute. So what do I want to talk about today? Well, I am not using this video to go through and break down things like the Biden speech or things that are, other states are doing right now because I don't, I don't really want to get into that. Trust me, there are more than enough channels out there that you can go to if you want that kind of breakdown. And as a matter of fact... The reason that I am going, or I'm making this video right now, is because I just watched another video, and I suppose I'll link it below, that was talking about New York, and specifically New York post the, uh, what's it called, the Bruin decision? I keep track of, of all the, the news that's going on, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I remember all the details. I think it's the Bruin decision, though. Anyway. The entire Bruin decision wrapped up in a very nice little package was this. A gun club in New York brought suit against the state of New York because the state of New York basically says you can't have firearms. Period. End of story. No ifs, no ands, no buts, no middle, no middling, no, no 
Secret words, no nothing, okay? No guns in New York. Which, of course, is a direct and blatant violation of the Second Amendment. Second Amendment says shall not be infringed. It's already pretty infringed. New York just made it egregiously so. And they were hardly the only ones. New York, California, New Jersey, Illinois, pretty much any Democrat stronghold across the country, you can bet that guns are banned there. So, I was watching that, listening to that, rather. I didn't, don't really watch a lot of things. I just kind of turned them on in the background. But they were talking about how New York was handed the Bruin decision. And New York was told, unequivocally, that you cannot do this. So what was New York's response? Well, of course, New York's response was to give the middle finger to the Supreme Court, tell the Supreme Court that you can't tell us how to run our state, and then they proceeded to pass an entire new, just a blanket of new laws, saying that, you know what, fine, we'll make it so you can get a gun, we will make it absolutely impossible to fulfill the process to get a gun, but sure, we'll make it legal. It is basically the equivalent of, how did they say that, the process is the punishment in law, where uh, you know that you can't win a case, but if you can bring the case, you can at least force whoever it is that you're suing to spend tens of thousands of dollars and waste a whole bunch of time that they can never get back. So that's what New York has done with the Bruin decision. And why am I talking about that right now? The reason why is I want to talk about civil war. And in fact, this applies to wars in general. Because the way I see it, there are only two reasons why you go to war. The first reason is, and the most important one is, sometimes you don't get a choice. And I believe I've mentioned this in, in previous videos, and I've even had some disagreements over it. But if somebody brings a war to you, you don't get a choice. Okay? I mean, if someone declares war, you're not going to sit down with a committee and say, no, hold on, can we, like, maybe think this over? No, the war's been declared, the armies are at the gates, we're done, okay? The conversation part of this is over. Which leads me into the other reason. When the conversation part is over. When there's a conflict, there are a myriad of ways to go about it. And it depends largely on how big your conflict is, but by and large, it's the same no matter. If you just have a conflict with your friend, you could sit down and talk about it. You could ignore it and just, you know, kind of sweep it under the rug and just say, we're just going to let bygones be bygones here. We're not going to, we're not going to make waves. You could also get a third party involved. Now, if, you, uh, if you're talking about a friend of yours, it might be a mutual friend between you. Or you could even go ahead and take it to court. That's what civil court is for. Why is this door open? Oh, by the way, I'm doing this live. So, like, enjoy my colony. This is my personal colony. Totally irrelevant. Anyway, you could bring in a third party to help mediate things. Um... These are all options that you could take to try and resolve things peacefully. Now, this is fine to a point. Even the uh, states, the individual states in the United States, have the same things available to them. Governors can talk to each other. They can work out their own disputes. There is nothing that says that they can't. And then, if that fails, there are courts that they can go to, specifically the Supreme Court of the United States. There is no higher court in the land. The Supreme Court almost exclusively exists to handle things between the states when the states themselves cannot work it out. So, why are we talking about this now? Well, the gun club brought the suit in the Supreme Court because there is no other court that can really handle this when you're suing the state itself. They did go through the lower courts, but, I mean, if you're asking the New York court to overrule the New York state, yeah, that's never going to happen. And as it turns out, it didn't. Who saw that coming? 
So it went to the Supreme Court. The ruling was that New York can't do that. And as such, they, New York was hereby ordered that they have to remove all of their laws that simply say no one can get a, can, uh, get a gun. Okay. Of course, there were the usual protests and riots and everything else after that. But immediately afterwards, the governor of New York came out and said, Well, I really don't care what the Supreme Court has to say. It's my state. I will run my state as I feel that I need to run my state, as I feel that I want to run my state, and that's it. No Supreme Court can tell me how to run it. And that meant that anyone with or that wanted a gun was basically being told, you, you have two choices. You can either, well, three choices. You can comply, you can violate the law, or you can leave. And many people did leave. People are fleeing New York like, you know, rats fleeing the Titanic. Of course, uh, I would point out that the Titanic went down in the middle of the ocean, and even the fleeing rats didn't get that far, so keep that in mind as far as metaphors go. So how does this tie back to, uh, to, to Civil War? Well, since that has come down, since the Supreme Court has determined that New York cannot ban firearms, there have been an absolute... Bevy. Bevy? I think bevy's the word I want. There's been a lot. Ooh, we have flak armor. How nice is that? There have been a lot of new lawsuits and appeals and everything else going on in New York. And of course, every single one of them has been thrown out. And it doesn't really matter which court you go to, 7th Circuit, Ninth Circuit. I don't actually know my circuits or how these things apply, but I know that every single court that has been ordered that this stuff is illegal has simply given the finger and told the Supreme Court to piss off. Now, why is that? Well, before I get to that, let me cover a couple of other things. Now, while I said I'm not going to go over the, uh, the speech that Biden gave, and I'm not going to, I am going to point out one thing in there, and that is that during the speech, he made a very clear dividing line between the MAGA Republicans and literally everyone else. And he did that very deliberately. He, he said that there are Republicans that he can get away or he can get along with and he can work with, and then there's just the rest, which to anyone with half a brain can read that as, look, you're either with me or you're against me, or you're simply not important enough. I mean, for the, the politically uninitiated, for the people who can't even be bothered to get out and vote, for the people who literally just do their 9-to-5 job and try not to get involved with politics and all that stuff, he, he doesn't care about those people. Yet. No, he, he was making a very clear dividing line between his opposition and calling them basically enemies of the Republic. There's also other issues. Take, for example, some one of your other hot-button issues, say abortion. Okay? Now, I'm not going to come out on record and say that abortion is good or bad. Call me a coward, whatever you want. Not the point of this. The point that I am going to get to is simple. And that is that when Roe v. Wade was overturned, and I want you to listen real carefully because there's a lot of people out there that don't get this. So if you're one of these people, pay attention. Roe v. Wade kicked the decision on whether abortion was legal back to the states. It did not make it legal. It did not make it illegal. It gave the decision to the state. Because before that, the Roe v. Wade said you can't. You cannot make it outright illegal. You can restrict it, but you can't make it illegal. And for a while, that was good. Obviously, that became not good very quickly. People were not happy with it, people weren't satisfied, and people stopped really paying attention to that. Again, neither here nor there. The point is that now we have many states in the United States 
that have said abortion is absolutely fine, don't care how much you do it, don't care when you do it. Some states are even going upwards of three weeks after birth. And if you think that that is me exaggerating, or if you think that's hyperbole, I would remind you that in California, I believe it is, they wanted to pass a law that would decriminalize infant death three weeks after birth. Now, ostensibly, their purpose was to say that if you have a case of, say, SIDS, and your baby just dies, and no one can explain why, that would not be criminal. Problem is that I don't know of any cases off the top of my head where that actually happened. So what we're really talking about here is just, if your baby dies for any reason, they don't care what the reason is, it would not be a criminal act. Well, how many times would that actually be applicable to something? I mean, in what circumstances would you need a law that broad? You got to think about it for a minute. Another hot button issue right now is immigration, especially on the southern border. Less so on the northern border, but that's just because no one really cares about Canadians. What are you going to do? So anyway, on the southern border, you have, I think it's Four primary candidates? Five? Texas, New Mexico. New Mexico is, is part of the southern border, isn't it? I think it is. Texas, New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, California. Those are the southern border states, if I remember my geography correct. And right now we have a massive immigration problem on the southern border. Ain't no one going to deny that. Because only the only people who do try to deny that there's a problem are so out of touch that even their own party calls them on it when they say, oh, it's not happening. It's like, no, it actually is happening. Like, you can say it's not a problem. You're, you're entitled to that decision. It's a stupid decision, but you're entitled to it. But you can't say that it's not happening. Anyway. In these states, we do have immigration laws. We do have borders. We have many of these things. The problem comes in that they're not being enforced. Now, here's where it gets complicated. Immigration laws are federal. Texas cannot make immigration law. They just can't. They can have customs on their border for processing people coming in, but if the government says that this cannot come into the country, Texas doesn't get to say, well, that's okay, we allow it. Which sounds an awful lot like the, uh, the argument for marijuana, but that's a different tangent. I'll get to that one in a second. Likewise, if the government wants to let people in, and Texas says, well, we don't want people from this country coming in, Texas can't do that. I mean, they, they just don't get that option. Should they? I don't know. Probably not. I do believe that immigration should remain a federal issue. The problem comes in, however, that right now, we have a federal government who is not doing immigration. They're, they're not. There are people that are coming across the border, thousands of people that are coming across the border every day. And the people that are supposed to be patrolling the border have their hands tied. They can capture people, only for those people to be let out. Uh, or they can just be, you know, given direct orders not to interfere. Or they can simply be removed from the border entirely. If everyone has been reassigned, then suddenly there's no one on the border. This has been a battle going on the border for years and years and years now. And the states have finally stepped up and said, if you won't do anything about it yourself, then we will. In this case, it's the uh, state of Texas using its state police and the Texas Rangers to enforce the border. In places like, I think it's Arizona, I believe the governor there has activated their own state guard, national guard. I don't know if it's a proper national guard. Not sure how that works out, but either way, 
they're mobilizing more forces to actually enforce their border. And of course, you have other states in the United States that are saying that we need to be a sanctuary, we need to take everyone, and deportation, everything is, is wrong and all that stuff. Very long story, not going to get into it, don't want to have that conversation right now. The point is that you have some states that are saying border must be enforced because this is hurting our state. You have other states that say, forget the border, let the people in. And there are a whole host of other issues as well. We could also get into the issue of trans people. Specifically, not trans people, trans children. And mind you, I, I have a dog in that race, but I'm not going to get into it. Because regardless of what you think of it, you have some states that are saying absolutely all of it, other states that are saying absolutely none of it. So where do I get to this? Or, or, or where am I going with this, rather? Civil War. As I said, there's only two times when you go to war. The first of which is when someone attacks. Now you don't have a choice. The war has come to you. There's not a whole lot of black and white on there. The other time is when all other options have failed. And before I cover Civil War, I want to make sure that you understand this applies to all wars. <clears throat> not just the Civil Wars. All of them. Pick a war. One side is going to be attacked. So right there is your first one, okay? The, the option was never there to refuse it. The second one is whoever's attacking. Now, they may be attacking for lots of reasons. It may be a war of territory. It may be a war of resources. It may be a war of aggression. It may be a war for a lot of things. But at its core, they're waging a war because whatever they want, whatever they need, whatever they're doing, they're not going to get it by asking, they're not going to get it by negotiating, they're not going to get it by compromising, they're not going to get it by trading, they're not going to get it any other way than to just come out and take it. And if they have to kill somebody to take it, then that is what they will do. Because this is the essence of war. You wage a war to take something or to destroy something. And quite frankly, once you've taken it, you can destroy it if you want. So let's just say that a war is to simply take something or to gain something. Regardless, you, you get where I'm going with this one. So how does that, that come to right now? Okay. Now is where I'm going to get into the actual topic of civil war. Don't need this right here. So the actual topic of civil war here in the United States. Well, I don't know that no one has necessarily really been attacked yet. There have been a few skirmishes that have been political in nature over the last several years. Um, lots of people will point to the, uh, the January 6th riot, and that's all I'm going to call it is a riot. I will not call it an insurrection, and I think that anyone who calls it an insurrection is a warmonger deliberately trying to start one. If it was an actual insurrection, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Congress would be dead, and we would have a king. So, not an insurrection. It's a riot, and when it happened, yes, there was fighting, a few people died, only one person, however, was actually killed for it, and that person was killed by the Capitol Police. Before that, however, we had the Summer of Love, as it has been so ordained, which was massive violence. It was political violence across the nation. Now, you can name the players in it however you want, but the fact is that you had one side versus another. You had progressives on one side who believed one thing. You had conservatives on the other side. Well, I would say conservatives and independents, and basically it is everyone else who wasn't part of them on the other side, and it was a year of just small skirmishes, with a few things that really punctuated the middle of it. I would say that there was the incident of the man who was shot twice in Portland, Oregon, 
Reports are sketchy since there's not a whole lot of reports and there's no actual surveillance, but if we are to believe the reports, the reports say that somebody shouted, there's one of the Trumpers, and then a guy took two to the chest. Now, maybe that's wrong. I don't know. If it is wrong, then it's good propaganda for somebody, and if it's right, that makes it even more worrisome. You go to war when all of the other options have worn out. We have so very many things that we are divided on. And the important thing right now is that there are no other options. Take the issue of abortion. Just because it's a very, very tumultuous one and people get very hot under the collar over it. When you talk about compromise, we had a compromise with Roe v. Wade. The compromise was safe, legal, and rare. The idea that we're not going to ban abortion because that would be wrong on a certain number of levels. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that, you know, we need to let everyone have it. It should be safe, it should be legal, but it should be rare. And for a long time, we had that. But then something changed, and it ceased to be rare. And when it ceased to be rare, I mean, when the number of abortions every year in certain communities actually began to outnumber the births in that community, when it ceased to be rare, the compromise was broken. And so we had to go back and we had to either reestablish the safe, legal, and rare part of it, or we had to change things. And when it came time to reevaluate this, we ended up in two camps. You had one side that said absolutely no restrictions at all. And they were very vocal and sometimes even violent about it. And I'm not going to make any kind of judgment on that. I'm not going to get into the morals of it. If you want morals, you can go look elsewhere. I'm not giving mine at this time. The point is, though, they drew a hard line and they said absolutely no restrictions, ever, at all, period. Well, the only response to that, since there is no compromise anymore, you're dealing with people who don't want to compromise, was to ban it entirely. And now here we are. One side says no restrictions. One side says no abortion. And there's no middle ground in there anymore. There's no compromise. On the topic of immigration, you have the states on the border that are saying enforce the border. We have laws. You don't need to make anything up here. You don't need to make any decisions. You don't need to discuss this in a committee. We have the laws. Just enforce them. And then you have those who simply don't want to. Where is the compromise here? What exactly are we supposed to talk about? What are we negotiating on? The answer is, we're not. We're, we're just not. What else? The, I, the, the trans kids thing. You have some people out there that want to start kids on, on uh, hormone therapy and begin transitioning sometimes as young as six months old. There are even people, and I think that even the left thinks they're a little bit crazy, but there are people out there who believe that they know if their kid is trans while the child is still in the womb. And I'm sorry, but if you believe that, you are actually insane. I, I'm, I'm not even going to entertain that thought process. You just are. There's no middle ground there. 
because you have those people who say that we should be putting children on trans therapies as soon as they're born, and the other side is saying, look, not at all. When they're an adult, they can make those decisions themselves. But you don't do surgeries and all of this stuff on children unless it's necessary. Which, of course, they, did, they deem that it is. It, that, that's kind of the whole crux of that. Pick any of your... Uh, ooh, there's some hops. Pick any of your controversial subjects and you'll get the same thing. You have one side who says everything, you have the other side who says none, and there's no compromise. And that also applies politically right now as well, because as Biden said in his last, his last uh, speech, there are the people of the United States, or there are the MAGA Republicans, and that's it. So he literally drew a line and said, you're either with us or against us. You're either a MAGA Republican or you're everyone else. There's no compromise in there. If, if somebody who was a, a Trump-supporting Republican, which I'm not a Republican, but I am a Trump-supporting independent. I mean, I'm pretty sure I don't need to spell that out, but just in case anyone out there was a little sketchy on the subject, yeah, I support Trump, did before, still do now. If you're going to brand every single person who supports your enemy as an enemy, well, then you have just removed the idea of compromise. And now that you have removed the, op or the, the, yeah, the option of compromise, what's your next move? Okay, if you aren't willing to sit down and talk about it, negotiate over it, compromise on it, but you still deem these people to be your enemy. What is your next move? And this is the thing that, that no one seems to be thinking about. No one is thinking that far ahead. What they're thinking about is that right now, we're not fighting. Right now, we're not at war. And that's partially true. Again, as I said, it's impossible to know you're in the war while you're in it. I mean, obviously, if there's a declaration of war, you can, but I mean, think about the Revolutionary War. From our standpoint, there was no Revolutionary War. We had a few skirmishes in uh, the colonies, until the Declaration of Independence was drafted, and why is everything up here on fire? Ah, <sighs> it's always something. Anyway, after the Declaration of Independence was drafted, uh, we put it on a ship, we sent it to England, and that was that. I'm sure that the people that wrote it knew there would be consequences for it, but they didn't know that we were actually in a war until the warships came back. At that point, yeah, it was pretty obvious we were in a war, but that was like a year later? Point is, when you've exhausted everything else, you're only left with one option, and that is to go ahead and go to war. And right now, it's looking like the left in this country, I don't want to say just the Democrats, because, I mean, the Democrats is a very large party that encapsulates a lot of things. I'm just going to say the left, the political left. They are doing everything but declaring war. They have swept the table. There's nothing left, okay? There's no papers, no pencils, no documents, no nothing. The table is clear. The only thing left to do is flip it. Which is why a lot of people right now are simply asking, when is that moment going to come? I mean, if we have already determined that everything else is off the table... What else can happen now? For just a moment, I want to go back to what I was talking about in that, that video on the New York case. Because the Supreme Court of the land set down a decision and said, in no uncertain terms, Second Amendment shall not be infringed. You as a state 
cannot supersede the Constitution and say, we are going to ban guns in our state because we said so. Even if the state voted on that unanimously, instead of it being a dictatorial, tyrannical, governmental executive order, even if the people voted on it, you cannot violate the Constitution. Now, they could still do it, and they could, in practice, annul the law the same way that many states have done with, say, marijuana laws. See? I told you I'd get back there. I know what I'm doing. Marijuana is illegal on the federal level. It's illegal in all 50 states. But I know what you're saying. Hold on. I thought there were states where it was, uh, it was legal. No, it is not legal. It is decriminalized. And there is a big difference there. Because the difference between legal and decriminalized is that if something is legal, you cannot be arrested for it by anyone. If it's decriminalized, however, you can still be arrested by the feds. If it's decriminalized in your state, then congratulations, you can have it if you want. The state police ain't going to bother you. But if a federal agent decides that they want you enough, they can come, and by the way, they will come, and they will lock you up forever. Because, you know, we're letting all the violent criminals out on the streets lately, but anyone who got caught with an ounce, yeah, you need to go away forever. We're going to put you under the jail. Regardless. That's not the Constitution, but it is a federal law, and it's basically been annulled by the state. Technically speaking, New York could do that, and... If, if that was really how people felt, this wouldn't really be a problem. Sure, you could have a few people that would be saying, well, you know, I want to carry a gun. But if the majority of the population said, yeah, we actually don't want them, then, you know, we wouldn't have them. Unfortunately for New York, that's not the case. Lots of people do want to carry, and their rights are being violated. So in terms of civil war and basically to civil conflict in general. I bring up New York because New York is currently, and this is my own speculation, New York is currently on the brink of revolution. I would even go so far as to say we may see political violence there soon of the hitman style. And the reason for it is this. The people who want to carry firearms, who want to own them and travel with them and everything else, have been told no. They took it to the court. The court said no. They took it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said no. It is your right as a U.S. citizen to carry a firearm if you so choose. But New York has said we don't care. New York has unilaterally said discussion is off the table, okay? Taking that arm right across the table, clean sweep. So the conversation is out. There's no more negotiation, and obviously, whatever compromises they had before, yeah, those are not being respected anymore either. I mean, the compromise that they had before was they had all these concealed carry permits and all the hoops that you had to jump through to get to them. Now New York has gone so far as to say even concealed carry will no longer be allowed because they have declared the entire state a sensitive zone and you can't carry even with a concealed carry. You sure as hell can't open carry. You're just not allowed to carry it at all. And by the way, your home is also a sensitive zone, so you can't even keep it at home. So what is there left? The government has come out and said that your voice no longer matters. Your rights no longer matter. You have no say in New York if you want to be a legal firearm owner and carrier. So if you have no more voice, well, what is that that they, they like to say? Riots are the voices of the unheard? Well, New York is working on it. And what is a war if not one really big riot? 
I mean, sure, when you get into proper warfare, there's a lot more to it. But in a civil war? Oh yeah, civil war is essentially just one great big riot. Because there's no formal battle lines. It's groups of people who are skirmishing in the streets, who are targeting institutions and landmarks, they're targeting infrastructure, and they're doing whatever it takes to simply drive their, their opposition, whoever that may be, into submission. And that's roughly where we are at right now. Because in New York, there is no other option left. The governor has come out and said that she does not care what the Supreme Court says. That was your last line. And the Supreme Court agreed with them and said, look, it's your right. She says it's not. So the only thing left is to either leave the state, which, as I said, many people have been doing, or it's going to get ugly. It's going to get real ugly. And I think it's going to get really ugly really fast. Because eventually people are going to say, if you don't care about my voice, if you don't care about my rights, then we're going to stop caring about yours. And when that happens, you will see massive numbers of people simply disobey. And of course, when they disobey the law, the law is going to have to crack down. And that's where things are going to get brutally ugly. But I bring that up because we're going to see that in a dozen different ways. That is just going to be internal inside of New York. Now, if we had an executive branch who actually did their job, because our executive branch sure as hell doesn't, then the feds would probably be rolling into New York right now, and they would probably be arresting the governor. Call it dereliction of duty, call it insubordination, Call it sedition. I would call it sedition. The Supreme Court has given you a direct order, and you have disobeyed it. You have disobeyed the, the nation. You're trying to uh, supersede our Constitution. I would say that's sedition. Regardless, if we had somebody to enforce it, it would have been done. Since they're not going to, that leaves it to the people. And it can only end in one way. So that is one battle line that's being drawn. Let's look at all the other ones. When it comes to um, the immigration thing, the states are already doing what they can to secure their own borders. So far, the federal government hasn't done anything about that. Mostly. They've done small things. For example, when the state of Texas put a great big old padlock on a gate that immigrants were using to get in, the federal immigration people, I believe that would be ICE, came through and cut the lock. Well, at this point now, you have two, two actual factions standing there saying, if you're just going to do this, then we're running out of options here. Those options are starting to look like if we put the lock back on and if you cut it again, if you try to cut it again, we shoot you. Because what other options are left? The same thing goes for, say, abortion. You have states that believe that abortion is strictly murder. And they will prosecute it as such. You have other states who declare that it is explicitly a human right. Well, if you believe either one of those, then one of two things is true. You have other states that have sanctioned murder, or you have some states who are literally violating people's human rights. And the answer to both of them, apparently, is going to be violent. Because, well, the Supreme Court has already said it's the state's choice, and if you feel that strongly about it that you need to do something about another state's laws, you can negotiate with them, sure. You could compromise. Or... You could simply, I don't know, invade. And I think we're real close to that right now. And I know it sounds hyperbolic. I mean, who could imagine the state of California invading the state of, I don't know, Nevada? Actually, I'm not sure that they could do that. Which one's on the left? Is it Nevada or Arizona? 
think Nevada's on the left. So yeah, actually Texas or uh, not Texas, California could invade Nevada if they so chose to. I need to brush up my geography. Will we see it? I don't know. Things would have to get really bad for that to happen. But now kick in a few other things. Let's say the trans kids thing. Again, you have one side saying that this is medically necessary and it is a human right for these kids to do so, even though the ages at which they want them to start doing it, they can't even form words. Or you have some states who say it's literal child abuse, on par with female genital mutilation and, say, the dancing boys of Afghanistan. Take your pick. How much longer until they do something about it? You have all of these other, these, these little skirmishes across the country, and then add on top the us versus them from the President of the United States, who has come out and explicitly stated that the MAGA-supporting Republicans are enemies of democracy, are enemies of the Republic, they are a danger to our culture and to our nation itself. Well, after you've made that declaration, there's nowhere else to really go. What else do you do with the enemy of your nation? You can either ignore them, possibly to your own detriment, or you can remove them. And now the choice is his. And, by extension, theirs, anyone who is also supporting him. And I do acknowledge that he tried to dial it back and said that, you know, not, not all Republicans are like that, and even not, maybe not even all MAGA Republicans are like that. But he then immediately followed up saying that Trump himself is a danger to the nation, and if you're following the danger to the nation, that by extension makes you a danger to the nation. Hey, this room is done. Fantastic. Um, that's where we're at right now. The question is... Where do we go next? And we have that question specifically because everything else has been swept off the table. In one speech, I can move those in a little bit. In one speech, Joe Biden wiped off the table the idea of conversation and negotiation. You cannot just have a conversation and ask somebody to stop being evil, which is pretty much his... uh, Pretty much his opinion right now. So where do we go from here? This is why the subject of civil war is trending everywhere. You have multiple different factions over multiple different issues in the United States. And there is no middle ground left. There is no compromising. There's no discussing. Whatever issue you have, whatever group you belong to, there is somebody out there who hates you and wants you to disappear. I can guarantee you, if we were living in the Marvel Universe and somebody in the world got a hold of all six Infinity Stones, there is an entire group of people in the world who would be gone faster than they could snap those fingers. They would have disappeared faster than the sound could have traveled. Just gone. We have those people all over right now. And I do spend most of my time ragging on the left. I spend most of my time ragging on the progressives, but I will not pretend that those people do not exist on my side as well, which I would just go ahead and call the sane side. And you know what? I might even go so far as to include myself in those people. But if I can justify myself, it is this. Give me an alternative. Right now, there's a lot of people that are looking for alternatives. But where are they? You cannot compromise with somebody who wants you destroyed. You just can't. There's nowhere for you to argue up from. If there's somebody who will only ever take your destruction, 
then you have nothing to negotiate with. You have nothing to bargain with and nothing to compromise on. And there's an awful lot of those people right now. Just, I, I cannot even express it. I don't have an answer. I don't have a very good answer anyway. I mean, until we have people that are willing to sit down, have that conversation, hammer out compromises, and figure out how to live together, we can't. I think it was Lincoln who said just before the Civil War that a house divided cannot stand. I think so. History is not my best subject because I despise history, but I'm pretty sure that was him. And right now, we are a house divided. Not in one way. We are a house divided in 12 ways. One of them is going to give. The only question is where and when. And the only question after that is how far is this going to escalate? There is a chance that if we had a real battle, I mean, something where a lot of people die, I'm talking hundreds, maybe even thousands of people dead, maybe it might be enough to snap a lot of people out of this, this tribal, I don't care what anyone else has to say, I'm the one that's right. It might be enough to snap them out of that. But I can't even guarantee that. There are some people that would probably still be so tribal and so fanatical, so zealous, that they, they would look at what happened and say, it's a good start. And then what do we do with those people? Ooh, you lost that trait. That's good. What, what do we do with those people? And I, I hate the way that sounds when I say it. But it's a matter of fact. And don't think that I'm the only one saying it. Before the previous election in 2020, keep in mind that Project Veritas, because, you know, they're, they're really good at doing their job, uh, Project Veritas came out with some hidden video from people, I think it was part of the Bernie Sanders campaign, if I remember right. But he's got them on video saying that after the election, after they win, that there would need to be re-education camps because there would need to be a way to re-educate and deprogram Trump supporters. When you say something like that, you are literally stating that you believe that one person's thoughts are inferior. They are so inferior that they do not, or they, they cannot be tolerated to exist. Well, we've heard that before, too. They said the same thing about the Jews. They said the same thing about the, um, uh, wait, what is it? it starts with an A. Um, Armenians? I think it's the Armenians. Could be wrong. Don't think I'm wrong, though. Anyway, we've had times in history where people have said, this thing, and it always involves people, this thing is intolerable, and it must cease to exist. That's where we're approaching. I don't know what else to say about it. I know, don't know what else we can do about it. All I do know is that it's here. There may be no avoiding it at this point. But it is here. Pretending that it's not is naive. And the people that are pretending that it's not, I believe, are being willfully ignorant. As I said, this kind of thing has been going on for years now. The numbers have been growing, but lots of people have been saying, you have more and more and more people, and I'm one of them. I wish that I had these thoughts down years ago. And unfortunately, I don't or I only started doing videos a couple of years ago. But I was one of those people that said, you have this group of people over here who are absolute zealots. They do not care what your argument is. They don't care what your evidence is. They don't care about you. 
and we can't deal with them. Sooner or later, one of these two groups is going to have to go. It's either going to be them, the, the ones who hold these wacky ideas, they're going to have to go because they're simply incompatible with society, or those people are going to take over, and they're going to have to re- just start removing anyone who disagrees with them. I used to say this about, you know, some Christian groups, because we have all kinds of things. We have carbon dating, we have dinosaur fossils, we have everything else. And when you show these things to some Christians, they'll, they'll kind of say, yeah, I know the book says this, but we, we know better. Keep in mind, the book is just allegorical, but there are those people out there who do so fervently believe that the world is only, what is it, 6,000 years old? That the Bible is literal history and that your attempt to dissuade them using dinosaur bones is literally an attack on their faith. Well, now we have that same fervor on the issues of just abortion. And maybe that's a bad example because we always did have that kind of fervor on abortion. After all, you did have a lot of religious groups that were very, very anti-abortion. Many of them still are. Most of them aren't violent about it. However, now we're seeing the exact opposite. You have some people who are so pro-abortion that they are going so far as to actually firebomb crisis pregnancy centers and adoption centers. And I don't even understand their their thinking with that one because how does that help you? What does an adoption center do that harms your cause? But nevertheless, they do it. This conflict is here. It's unavoidable at this point. I mean, I wish it was. But you can only have a conversation, you can only have peace when both sides are willing to sit down and talk. And there's no more talking anymore. So at this point, all I can really say is I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know what's going to happen next. I'm pretty sure I know what's going to happen eventually. I mean, unless there is some kind of coup d'etat or some kind of revolution that instantly removes one group overnight, it's going to come to blows. It has to come to blows. It cannot end any other way. So now we wait and see what happens. So as much as everyone likes to pick on the preppers, you better be prepared. You better know your area. You better know your family. You better know the people that you can trust. You better have supplies. You better have tools. You better have the skills. Because sooner or later, they're going to be put to the test. Unless, by some miracle, we can come back together and actually reform a common culture. I just don't see it happening. And neither do a lot of people, which is why Civil War is the trend right now. Anyway, that's depressing enough right now, so I think I'm going to go ahead and take a break here. I'll probably be back because I have some other videos that I want to do. I have one that I've been rolling around my head on conservatism, specifically what it is and why it seems to have failed. Like I said, I'm just... I have critically low self-esteem and self-confidence, so even as much as I think about it, I always question whether or not I I should even make the video because I could always be wrong. It's my own personal failing. It's my cross to bear. I'll have to get over it at some point. I mean, I had the same feeling when I started this channel in general. I got over that. So I'll make sure to get back to you with that video and other subjects, which reminds me, if there's any other subjects that you'd like to discuss, you might want to hear my opinion on it, maybe you think that I have a different view than yours, let me know down in the comments. If you want to comment on this video or just mention anything, or hell, we can just have a full conversation in the comments too. You want to discuss the color blue? We can do that. I don't care. I'm here. At any rate, we, we can have that conversation. So, do me a favor, if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. I have over 100 subs now, and I cannot tell you how pleased that I am. I think the last I saw was up to 127. 
which by the way, if you're listening to this and you're like actually a real person, let me know down in the comments because I hardly get notified for all these subscriptions and I have a feeling that most of them are bots. So a little bit of validation would go a long way. Feel free to leave a like on the video too. It helps the algorithm a lot. And I know that I've been getting shared by the algorithm more often, so please help this one get shared too. Share this video out with anyone that you think might, uh, might enjoy it. Leave the comments down below. And I'll see you next time for whatever it is that I have ready for you. <laughs> I just hope you're having a good day while you can still have a good day. Till the next time, take care.